And then notice this. It's so beautiful. Notice what he says. Verse 6. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love. Verse 7. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. David is saying, remember me, but not my sins. This is the way that you can be accepted by God. God has come in the person of Christ to take your sin so that when God sees you, He remembers not your sin, but instead what He remembers is you. He came to be in relationship with you. And when you accept Christ, what He wants you to know first and foremost is He doesn't hold your sin against you anymore. Instead, the whole power of your life becomes rooted in the assurance that your relationship with God can't be hindered or broken because of your sin, but instead you belong to Him because of the merits of Jesus. And so therefore you can be assured God remembers not your sin, instead He remembers you. And then David continues. And what he asks for next is just beautiful and prophetic. Because at verse 8 he says, good and upright is the Lord. He's good and he's righteous. I say this all the time. God is good and God is righteous. He is merciful and he's also just and to do the right thing. He's not a God who endorses sin. He is a God who's good and he doesn't endorse sin. So what what can you ask of a God who's good but who does not endorse sin? This at verse 8. Therefore, He instructs sinners in the way. God instructs us. The word for instruct in the Hebrew actually comes from the word to throw. Like sending something where you want it to go. And thus it's from this word that etymologically develops the word to teach. Thus the word Torah comes from this word. So to instruct originally meant to, to throw into the right direction. It can even mean to bring the early rain. It means that one who has something to give can give it. And so what David is saying is you, you instruct me instead of shaming me when I do something that's wrong. Years ago, I, I, in, a, in a different church, many years ago, I was a youth minister, and I played on the softball team, and I'm terrible at softball, and I was playing catcher, and, and I, I dropped the ball. Somebody's coming into home plate, and they scored, and, and one of the leaders on the team hollered at me. He said, Alan, catch the ball. And I wanted to holler back and say, I can't catch the ball. I've already dropped it. <laughs> Because the fact of the matter is telling somebody who's already dropped the ball, oh, why can't you catch the ball? Doesn't help me catch the ball. If you want me to catch the ball, come teach me how. Instruct me in a better way. Please know this about God. Please know this about the Holy Spirit. He's the sweetest, greatest, most wonderful coach in the world. He instructs the sinner. He didn't come to shame you. He came to change you. And David asks, therefore, not only for pardon for his guilt, but David also asks for something astounding. At verse 14, the friendship of the Lord see, when your shame gets lifted by Christ, what you start realizing is that God came to be in relationship with you, to be a friend to you, to have a, an honoring, beautiful relationship with you. Verse 16, turn to me and be gracious to me for I'm lonely and afflicted. What shame does is it makes us want to isolate ourselves and hide. But what happens when the grace of God comes is that God, you see Him turning toward you. Turn toward me. It's like saying, lift up your face towards me. Eastern cultures, uh, when to describe shame, call it losing face. 
But if you have honor, you save face. And what this means is that when people are ashamed, they drop their face or they cover their face. Or if someone is ashamed of you, they drop their face. If a little boy sees his father's face drops, he thinks my father is ashamed of me. And so to say, turn to me, Lord, is to say that the father looks at you and his face is lifted up upon you. His countenance is upon you. It means he never turns away ashamed of you. The answer is to find yourself in Christ. To find him to be, at verse 20, your refuge. And the question of the psalm, the question of this psalm is, is, is all rooted right here in this question. Who is the man who fears the Lord? That question that David puts forward. Who is the man who fears the Lord? That question is ultimately and finally and fully answered in the coming of the Son of David, Jesus Christ. He is the one who is fully forever lived up in full reverence of God, never disobeyed God. And so we are, as David is referencing prophetically, we are the offspring of the Lord. We are the ones who are... are the beneficiaries for the covenant that God has made in Jesus Christ. And so what happened at the cross is that Jesus became our sin in order to take our guilt. But Jesus also isolated from everyone that He knew and loved, even experiencing a sense of God-forsakenness on the cross. He bore our shame so that the shame could come off of us. All throughout history, every human heart has been crying out with the psalmist, let me not be put to shame. And in Jesus Christ, the answer has come. You in Christ are accepted forever and forever. Jesus not only takes your sin, He takes your shame. And that is the gospel.